The Serpent of Snowshoe Lake There's nothing quite like a dirt road leading into the woods in northern Maine. One road leads to another, which leads to three more, and before you know it, you're 25 miles deep, with no idea how you got there, and no idea how to get back. Interestingly enough, if you took a pen and a map and drew in every single woods road that existed in the state of Maine, you would get a picture that looks almost entirely unlike George Washington. However, that is not the focus of this story. A particular interest to us today is a certain set of roads that, when traveled upon, will lead you to Snowshoe Lake. Now, Snowshoe Lake may not at first appear much different than the dozens of other sublimely picturesque main lakes that dot the countryside. But this lake holds a secret. A very big secret. A very long secret. A secret with lots of rather sharp teeth. This is the story of the first and last people to uncover the secrets of the Serpent of Snowshoe Lake. Alan and Lana Michaels were crammed into the back seat of an aging Ford F-150, currently rethinking every decision in their lives that had led up to this moment. They had been having a perfectly simple, perfectly happy life in California. Nice climate, nice neighbors, just nice, you know? And then Lana's friend Misty from college just had to write them a letter begging them to visit her in rural Maine, and Lana just had to get nostalgic for the good old days of five years ago. And they just had to book a ticket all the way across the country to the middle of nowhere. Not long now, Misty announced, turning around to grin at the two of them. About half hour or so and we'll be gone. You, you said that this place was just a bit up the road, Alan complained, his entire body rattling from the rough dirt road below. We've been going for two hours now. Misty shrugged. It ain't just a bit up the road. I forget you out-of-staters don't understand the northern main directions. Anything shorter than a trip up to Portland, just a bit up the road. Anything longer than that, stay a ways out. There's more than that, of course, but uh, that'll get you started. Lena leaned forward in her seat. I can't, can't wait. Your letter made it sound so beautiful. Her view out the windshield was quickly blocked by Misty's dog, who had sensed the presence of an unlicked face and needed to correct this issue immediately for the safety of the universe. Uh, uh, down, Bowie! I stop French my friend, you goof! Misty barked, playfully shoving her dog back down into the front seat. You two can kiss all you want at the lake. Alan sighed and leaned his head against the window. He wasn't cut out for this sort of thing. His idea of roughing it was going to a Motel 6 instead of a Hilton. Sure, they had bought all the best and most comfortable camping equipment, but they were still in for a weekend with no TV, no video games, and no Wi-Fi. They were so deep in the woods by now that there wasn't even a signal to get a phone call out. A sudden passing sign caught his eye. Wait, did that just say tr tr Troll Bridge? Why would... Ah! He suddenly shouted, jumping away from the window. Misty had stopped the truck in the middle of a bridge, leaving him face to face with a snarling troll. Or perhaps it was actually just a mannequin dressed up in camo hunting clothing with a crude rubber troll mask strapped onto its face. Alan felt his face flush with embarrassment as Misty howled with laughter. Ha <laughs> ha! Gotcha! Ha <laughs> oh, I love it! The troll claims another victim! She reached out the window and grabbed one of the troll's floppy arms and shook it. Thank you, my friend. We'll leave your bridge now. Lena snickered, unable to help herself. This must be some of that famous woods humor that you were telling me about in your letter. <laughs> That's pretty good. I'm surprised no one messes with it, honestly. Misty shrugged. Eh, sometimes people get mad after getting spooked and toss them in the river, but eh, someone always finds them and puts them back on the bridge. That's the way of the woods, you know. When you're this deep in, you gotta have, be able to have a little fun. Maybe on the way out I'll show you the Great Flamingo Flock, uh, the last outhouse. Oh, and we'll be passing by the deer. But we've already seen a few deer today, Lana pointed out. What makes this the deer? Well, a 
just been standing in the same place for years and years and years. Someone tried to shoot it one day, and it didn't even move. Misty paused for a moment and then added, Well, I may have had to go and stand it back up the next day and uh, replace an antler too, and a bit of foam here and there, uh, but it's still mostly there. The rest of the trip passed mostly uneventfully, apart from Misty pretending she had forgotten the way in a mostly successful attempt to freak Alan out. After what seemed like countless hours and intersections, Misty turned down a road with a hand-painted wooden sign reading Sawdust Pile Boat Launch. We're here, she announced, cutting the engine. Grab your stuff and find a nice spot for us out in the pile. Looks like we're lucky. No one else decided to come down here this weekend. Alan and Lana both gaped as they exited the truck. They knew they were going to be camping on some sort of sawdust pile, but neither of them expected this. The sawdust pile stretched on for as far as the eye could see, creating a strange sort of Martian landscape in the middle of the forest. Walking on it was quite odd. There was clearly a sort of crust on the top, but every step so sort of felt like walking on a foam mattress. Sure, it was soft, but you never quite knew when a step would be too soft and send you falling flat on your face. Bowie had meanwhile leapt from the truck and was skidding around the sawdust pile, alternately barking, woofing, roughing, sniffing, rolling, spinning, and marking the trees around the edge as his property. After a few minutes, he padded silently to a spot near the middle of the sawdust pile and curled up, yawning. Ah, looks like Bowie found the perfect spot before you, Misty grinned, lugging a massive cooler. Come on then, get moving. We need to get the tents pitched before it gets dark. Ah, oh, sure thing. How hard could it be? Alan's face fell as he unzipped their tense carrying case to reveal the perplexing masks of rods, wires, and tent stakes. Clearly, the brand new Easy Pitch Super Tent he bought online last week was going to be anything but. Uh... Missy noticed the look on his face and ran over. Ah, don't you worry about that. It's easy, she said, grabbing hold of the whole bundle. Taking a specific rod in both hands, she tossed the rest of the tent in the air and brought her hands down sharply in a snapping motion. All of the assorted bits of the tent immediately locked into place as she settled it in a level spot on the ground. Eh, yeah, nothing to it once you get the hang of it. She turned and walked back to her own tent as Alan attempted to pick his jaw back up off the ground. The next few hours were a blur of activity for the Michaels as they had bought and brought just about every item that they thought they could ever need for camping. By the time they were done inflating, assembling, and unwrapping, it looked as though someone had decided to start an L.L. Bean catalog photo shoot in the middle of nowhere. They were also starving and exhausted. Lena poked her head out of the tent. Uh, so, Misty, uh, where are you setting up your grill? Grill? Who said anything about a grill? Misty grunted, tossing fireworks... <laughs> tossing firewood out of the back of her truck. We're cooking the way nature intended! She pointed to a partially rusted rim of an old truck tire that had been fashioned into a sort of fire pit. A small picnic table and the moldy remains of some forgotten camping chairs surrounded it. Eh, which one of you wants to get the kindling ready? She grinned. The three of them spent an almost enjoyable half hour collecting armfuls of dried sticks and branches, some with the brown remains of old pine needles still clinging feebly to them. As Misty began the process of building the fire, Linda started digging various utensils and supplies out of one of their many nylon sacks. Well, we came prepared, of course, she noted. Here's a portable steel grate, a spatula, tongs, everything we'll need. Alan, honey, could you grab the foil packs for tonight? Misty's head shot up. What? Foil packs? What do you guys pack to eat, anyway? Well, well they're these lovely little foil packages we made up, each one with one course of our dinner. We have potatoes, chickens, misc vegetables... Lena noticed that Misty was rolling her eyes. What? I've read everyone out in the woods makes meals like this. Not out here we don't. Out here, we need only three things to keep us going. She popped open her cooler and produced a large pink package. Jordan's Red Hot Dogs! Thumping that onto the picnic table, she opened the passenger door of the truck and produced two grocery bags. Buns and the Dump Day. 
One bag was stuffed full of packages of store brand hot dog buns, and the other was overflowing with bags of Humpty Dumpty brand barbecue chips. That's what you're gonna eat all weekend? Alan's eyes brows raised. Isn't that just a little unhealthy? Hey, it's one of the rules of snowshoe! Misty protested, producing a metal skewer still caked with dried and burnt marshmallow from its last usage. She thrust the end into the fire while intoning, Rule number one. Always have some red hot dogs with you. Rule number two. Always put your fire out when you're done with it. And rule number three. You never, ever go out on the lake after dark. That's what my parents taught me. And now I pass it on to you. She gave a small bow and solemnly began to jam hot dogs onto the now red hot skewer. Lena protested. Wait, what? We, we can't go on the lake at night. But, but I was hoping to go on the canoe and stargaze of Alan tonight. Sorry, no can do, Misty shrugged, her hot dogs now completely engulfed in the roaring fire. If you go out after dark, the serpent's gonna get you. After a moment, she looked up and saw the looks on her friends' faces. What? I never told you about the serpent of Snowshoe Lake? Uh, no. Alan's eyes widened. I thought Maine didn't have anything beyond little garter snakes. Missy's eyes sparkled in the firelight. She sat down on the opposite side of the fire, a hot dog in each hand. The Serpent of Snowshoe Lake is a legend passed down through untold generations. Somewhere out there, deep down in the dark and murky depths of, uh, darkness, there lives a giant serpent. He's bad, and he's people, uh, just, just something. She took a giant bite out of one of her hot dogs. I guess I didn't pay enough attention to my pants stories. All I know is it's out there, it's bad news, and uh, it's why no one goes out on the lake at night. Alan scoffed. Come on. You're telling me that some sort of Nessie lives down there? This is another one of those tricks you play on out of staters, right? We're not that gullible. Misty's smile faded. Uh, no, I think this is real. They never talked about this one like it was some sort of joke. They told me... Uh, why did they tell me again? She pounded her head in frustration. They, they said... They said... They said if I wouldn't believe them, then I should ask the king! She brightened up. That's it! I'll take you to see the king tomorrow! Lena laughed. What? So Elvis lives on this lake too? <laughs> I wish. Misty was being surprisingly serious. Nah, this isn't Elvis. This is the king of Snowshoe Lake. I don't remember what his name is. Everyone just calls him King. He sits on this dock on this big old chair like a throne, waving at everyone that goes by. He's the one who told my parents about the serpent. We'll head over there tomorrow, and you can talk to him yourself. He's a nice guy. A little crazy, but uh, who isn't out here? <laughs> she flashed them a wicked grin. The rest of the night passed fairly uneventfully, the three of them chatting by the fireside until it was well and truly dark. As the conversations in fire ebbed to nothing but embers, Misty finally jumped up and clapped her hands. All right, time to hit the sawdust, she announced. Lots of relaxing to do out tomorrow, after all. She stood up and grabbed a large pail of water that she had prepared earlier. And now to take care of the fire. Why do you need to drench it? Ellen asked. It's already burning down to nothing on its own. <sighs> Let me put it this way, Misty grimaced. We're in the middle of a forest, in the middle of the dry season. We're also sleeping on a giant pile of sawdust. Do you see any reason why anyone in their right mind would not ensure all the coals are completely cool before going to bed? Oh, I see. Uh, point taken. Good, she said, emptying the bucket over the top of the fire. The coals hissed and spat as the water invaded their personal space and stole all of their heat. When she accomplished, she stretched and yawned. Ah, good night, you two. Lena waved as they each retired to their tents. Good night. Uh, don't sleep on a skunk while you're sleepwalking. <laughs> as they zipped the tent, Alan whispered, Oh, what was that? Some kind of college in joke? Well, sort of. Uh, it's more like a true story that turned into a joke. And... Night came in much the way that millions of knights have in the past. 
While they slept, a bull moose ambled through the area, regarding their campsite with a sort of moosey indifference on his way to the lake. Eagle-eyed watchers with access to a copy of the lake's topographical map would find it interesting that as the moose went on his merry way, he very specifically kept the shallowest sections of the lake, never even going in up to his knees. They would also find it interesting that not a single bird perched on the lake at night, apart from loons which fear no creature in the known universe. Even so, they stayed up at the surface and kept their laughing calls to a bare minimum. They knew better than to dive at this hour. And in the depths of Snowshoe Lake, something moved. It was probably a fish or something. Probably. The next morning, Alan grumbled and attempted to pull some blankets over his head as the first rays of the morning sun illuminated his tent. However, as he was currently sleeping in a sleeping bag, he only managed to yank his feet upwards into the air. Realizing where he was, he took a few moments to take stock of his situation. He was cold, lying on the floor of the tent instead of the air mattress for some reason, and everything hurt. All in all, better than he expected. Groaning, he attempted to make his way back to the air mattress and to try to catch even a few extra minutes of sleep. As usual, air goblins had come in the night and stolen a bit of air out of the mattress. How else do you explain why they're always losing air? But it still looked comfortable enough. Alan smiled and sighed in relief as he flopped down next to his wife. His wife, thanks to the transfer of motion that air mattresses have, then flopped up into the air. This flop that led to a flop led Alan to once again flop over and off the mattress back onto the floor. Lena, somehow still deep in slumber, simply turned and sprawled out across the rest of the mattress. Alan sighed and extracted himself from first the sleeping bag and then the tent. Yawning and stretching, he stumbled his way over to the lake to take a look at the surface. The sight nearly took his breath away. A small amount of mist was swirling on the water's surface, slowly melting away as the golden rays of the sun began to shine upon it. The scene looked like something off an expensive postcard, the kind you send the family and friends you want to feel jealous of your vacation. Alan smiled. Despite the fact that his back felt like he had been sleeping on a couple of boards, or the remnants of them, after all. You can't look at a view like that and be upset with the world. After a few minutes of silent lake introspection, Alan trudged back over to the tents in time to see his wife's head emerge, bleary-eyed but smiling. Uh, good morning, love, she yawned. How did you sleep last night? Alan's smile drooped a little at the corners. Um... Uh, great. Uh, just great. Uh, how about you? Oh, just wonderful. That air mattress is like sleeping on a cloud. She emerged from the tent with a graceful stretch. Hey, what is that on the door of Misty's truck? She suddenly pointed. Looks like a note. Alan walked over. There was indeed a note taped to the door of the truck. He pulled it off. Hey, guys. Well, we took off into the woods this morning after deer. Hasn't come back yet. I'm going to track him down and get my morning running at the same time. You two should take the canoe over and chat with the king. P.S. There's coffee in the thermos and the seed if you two sleepyheads want any. He shrugged. I guess she thinks she'll be gone for a while. I'll take some of that coffee for sure, though. He reached in and grabbed the thermos, as well as the extra mug that was also lying conveniently in the seat. Oh, cream. <laughs> oh, man, I guess I'll just have to take it black. He took a sip. <laughs> This was no ordinary black coffee. This was coffee from the darkest pits of the earth, roasted and ground until every milligram was as potent and powerful as coffee could possibly become. Every cell in Alan's body felt awake, and he wasn't quite sure if he would ever be able to sleep again. Lena gently took the cup from his trembling hand. Oops, <laughs> guess I should have told you she likes her coffee strong. She laughed and sipped some gingerly. I had to get used to it back in college. <laughs> the first time she made coffee for the dorm, I couldn't sleep for a week straight. Well, 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 wouldn't you start hallucinating after a few days? Alan's right eye was twitching. She shrugged. Then after a few months, the hallucinations don't bother you too bad. Let's grab the canoe and get in the water. I haven't been able to stop thinking about this serpent thing all night. Alan nodded. 
I've been thinking about it too. And there's something I want to do on our way across the lake. He dove into the tent and started digging around for something. Ah, come on, where is it? Ugh. Aha! He emerged, triumphantly crunching a small camera to his chest. We're going to prove this stupid serpent of snowshoe lake thing doesn't exist once and for all. Lena tilted her head. The GoPro? I, I don't know why you'd... Oh! You want to put it in the waterproof case thing and drop it down the lake, right? That way we'd be able to find out if the serpent really exists. It doesn't exist. Alan shook his head. I'm a man of science, not silly superstitions. We'll take some nice shots at the bottom of the lake and show this king that the serpent is just a dumb tale that no one needs to care about anymore. Oh, uh, now I see why everyone can tell that you're from away. Lynn amused. <laughs> oh, whatever, let's get moving. I haven't wanted to paddle around this lake for years. Their canoe cut as smoothly into the water as a green canoe-shaped knife. Quietly, the two of them battled their way into the center of the lake. By now, the sun had fully risen and cast off the rest of the mist hanging over the water. It was a cool August morning, without a cloud in the sky, and as the water below them grew deeper and deeper, the darkness below was a stark contrast to the bright blue above. Uh, this ought to be deep enough to start, Alan said, grabbing his patent-pending Serpent Finder 2000. A GoPro with a waterproof LED headlamp duct-taped to the side of the case, attached to some heavy fishing line. After ensuring the camera was recording and the light was on, he gently dropped them overboard. As they slowly sank out of sight, Alan estimated the depth allowed. Six feet? That's about fifteen. Twenty-five? Thirty-five? We're over fifty feet down now! Oh, holy cow! That ought to be deep enough, Lana said, grabbing hold of the line. Paddle us around and I'll hold on to the line! For about an hour, Alan paddled them around in circles going back and forth across the deepest portions of the lake. Lena looked at her wristwatch after a while. I think we got enough footage? If there's anything down there, we ought to have gotten a good look at it. Yeah, let's pull it up and let's let it dry off a bit while we paddle over to the peninsula. Alan nodded. The peninsula of the king was the most notable feature of the lake, and that's saying something considering the giant sile of sawdust on one side. With forest on all sides, the peninsula was like a little slice of civilization in the wild. The grass was neatly mowed all around the two beautiful camps nestled amongst the trees, and there were even a set of electric lights that could be seen twinkling through the night when the generator was on. And on the great dock of that peninsula sat the king's throne, a massive reclining chair that looked like it had weathered countless storms. The same could be said of the king, who seemed to be regarding them impassively with arms crossed as they approached. As they reached the dock, they realized he was actually sleeping. A slight snore emerged from underneath the trepper cat, shielding his face from the sun. Lena looked about nervously, then ventured, Um, uh, Mr. King? The king awoke with a start, swinging his head this way and that before looking down into the water. <coughs> oh, ahoy there, friends, he laughed, his face breaking out into a huge smile. Hey, don't get too many visitors around these parts these days. Uh, what brings you to my, uh, little paradise? Well, sir, my friend Misty said you were the person to talk to if we wanted to learn more about the Serpent of Snowshoe Lake. Little Misty sent ya! <laughs> he clapped his hands together. I thought I heard her across the lake last night. She's been coming around here with her folks and she was knee-high to a pickerel. <laughs> so, you want to learn more about the old serpent, do you? I think you better beach that there boat and follow me. Slowly maneuvering himself out of his throne, he beckoned the two of them to follow. It wasn't long before the three of them were standing at the door to one of the king's cabins. He paused at the door, keys in his hand. I warn ya, he grinned, his eyes twinkling. I've had people run out of here scared after death after what I've told them. You folks are from away. A fair few of them are a little spleeny. You sure you want to learn more? Lena and Alan both nodded. All right, then. We'll have it out over lunch. He quickly unbolted the padlock and pushed the door open. The cabin was even more impressive on the inside. The two of them felt immediately at home as they walked in and took in their surroundings. Wow! Lena gasped, running her hand over the wooden table in the middle of the room. It looked as if someone had cut down a gigantic tree, chopped out the middle section, and said, Yeah, that's your tree right there. It was sanded and polished to a mirror sheen. 
It's beautiful. Eh, not bad, not bad, the king mused. That's like the dickens if you drop it on your toe, though. <laughs> he gestured towards the kitchen area, which was piled high with chips, snacks, and foods of all kinds. The boys came up here to visit yesterday and stocked me up for a few days. Help yourselves. One smorgasbording later, the king stared intently at the two from over a plate heaped high with various desserts. So, it's time to tell you all about the serpent of Snowshoe Lake. He's been here for years. And as we can figure, he's probably about 350 years old. And while no one's ever caught full sight of him and lived, I'm pretty sure he's at least the length of a football field. I saw his face one time, you know. Teeth the size of steak knives. He must be living off the fish down there, I tell you. You don't live for 500 some years off eating a couple of people who decide to vote after dark. Alan looked at him. You just said before that he was about 350 years old. Well... The king looked pensive for a moment. He's probably near to a thousand years old now that I come to think of it. Snakes can't live that long, Alan exclaimed, exasperated. Nothing can. And now I know full well that there's no way anything the size of a football field is living in this lake. The king got to his feet. Ha ha, we have an unbeliever in our midst, he announced. Luckily for you, I have photographic proof. He bent down and began rifling through photo albums, stuffed haphazardly on a shelf. There! He tossed an album onto the table, open to a bookmarked page. Amongst a sea of pictures of smiling people in blaze orange clothing, there was a single Polaroid of a slightly blurry shape in the water. Lena squinted at it. I... I can't tell what's going on. The king looked down and quickly snatched the album away. Uh, whoops, uh, wrong album. That's for the Polo Dip of 89, and uh, <laughs> it's a good thing it turned out so blurry. He grabbed another bookmarked album and offered it to them. Here, that's the right one. The photos in the album showed what appeared to be a serpent's head poking out of the water, snarling angrily. But there was something off about the photos, and Lana was the first to point it out. That looks kind of strange. I've never seen a creature with eyes that white before. Ellen agreed. It makes it look like there's some sort of inflatable toy that's being held just under the water or something. Lana pointed up to the rafters of the camp. It looks a lot like that pool floaty up there, actually. The king glanced up and scoffed. Ha <laughs> ha! Of course it does. I had that made up specially. Used to give them out to the family and friends when they came to visit, you know. Come on, we're not stupid, Alan exclaimed. Just admit that you made it up. There's no serpent out there, and I can prove it. I've personally seen that smurf serpent eat a man whole. <laughs> Teeth like saws it had. The king began immediately, but stopped as he began to process what Alan had just said. Um, uh, how can you prove it? Ellen produced the GoPro from the backpack that they had brought in. With this, I'll just pop the micro SD into the tablet here, and we'll see just what really is under the waters of Snowshoe Lake. He began to wrestle with the waterproof case while Lana dug around the backpack for their tablet. It took them a few minutes, but Ellen finally pried the GoPro from the waterproof case and extracted the micro SD card. And now, I give to you the bottom of Snowshoe, he said with a flourish, jamming the memory card into the tablet's reader. As the video began, not much could be seen but murky water. As the video continued, not much could be seen but murky water. Alan began to fast forward through the video hurriedly. Come on, come on, we had to have gotten some clear footage here somewhere. Hold up! The king shouted. Back up a pace! I thought I saw something on the leg bed there! As Alan rewound and restarted the video's playback, the king jabbed a finger at the bottom of the screen. Stop there! And look at that! Lena shuddered involuntarily. Ugh, is that what I think it is? Yep, that's my wife's whole pair of false teeth! I was wondering where they ended up. Oh, wouldn't she have loved to see this? The king smiled wistfully. The video continued. Eventually, the dusty, murky bottom cleared somewhat, and the dark shapes of ancient logs and lost pieces of fishing equipment became visible. We've been scanning the bottom of this lake for 40 minutes now, and no serpent, Ellen announced.
Suddenly, there was a bright flash on the video. Whoa! Lana jumped. Go back, go back, go back, go back! What was that? Alan moved the video back and started it again. After a few misses, he managed to hit pause at the exact moment of the bright flash. Together, they all stared at the picture before them. No way! Lena breathed. There's no way! Alan was attempting to keep calm. There's a perfectly reasonable explanation. That's probably just a fish. They got really close to the camera. Nothing to worry about. The king had gone slightly pale. Uh, uh, fish don't have golden red eyes like that, he stammered. It's just a trick of the light. And why are you so upset? Shouldn't you be happy if we caught another glimpse of the fabled serpent of Snowshoe Lake? The king slumped down in his recliner. I, 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 I thought we made it all up, you see, he murmured. Give people a good scare, a, a good story, but that's real. And Dad was right all along. So that thing about not boating on the lake after dark? Lena asked. I just told people that so they wouldn't be bothering me. Opening up late at night when I'm trying to get some shut-eye. He muttered. But my dad, he told me the same thing. He was being serious. Alan threw his hands in the air. You two are ridiculous! He shouted. There is no serpent in this lake! And I can prove it. Once and for all. Lena had seen her husband in this state many times, and the best thing to do was just humor him. Okay, she said, folding her hands in front of her. And how do you propose that we do this? Night fell before they could believe it. The preparations were complete, of course, but they could all feel the tension in the air. Even if none of them truly believed that the serpent was real, what if it was? But there was no time for cold feet now. The experiment was ready. Alan solemnly walked over to the king's old metal boat, catching a small seedy boombox. Here goes nothing, he muttered, placing it at the bottom of the boat. As he pressed the play button, top country hits of the 90s started blaring at full volume. Send it, he bellowed, running back down the dock. At Alan's signal, Lana and the king began pushing the boat with all their might, sending it towards the middle of the lake. It was thankfully a clear and windless night, so the boat slowly started bobbing across the lake, blasting out country hits of the 90s for all of the fours to hear. My dad told me the serpent hated new country, the king had told them earlier. Although that might have just been because he hated it. The three of them watched the boat float further and further away from the glow of the king's electric lights. Too much longer we'll have to break up the spotlight. Uh, wait. What's that? The king exclaimed, pointing to the water. A few bubbles had formed around the boat. Alan groaned. Oh, great. The boat's probably sinking. You told me it would hold up for at least a couple of hours before holding on water. Those ain't no ordinary bubbles, the king whispered urgently. Now quiet down and look. For at least a minute, they watched as a few bubbles floated up around the boat here and there, popping harmlessly as they reached the surface. Then the lake exploded. The boat was sent upwards in a gigantic geyser, shooting at least a hundred feet in the air. The boombox, less hampered by gravity, continued traveling upwards and away. They could hear it calling as it flew out of sight. A plaintive, a bird skirt and buggy! Fading into the night sky. As the boat began to tumble back to earth, something caught it. Something very, very large. Silvery scales caught the reflection of the boat's light as the massive creature wrapped itself around the boat and dragged it below the surface. And then there was silence, broken only by the lapping of the waves created by the creature's appearance. The three looked at each other, faces nearly frozen in fear. My, my, uh, my boat! The king finally croaked. Foam! The silence was broken by a hollow, ringing metallic sound coming from across the lake. They didn't have to wait long to find out what had made it, as the remains of the king's boat came tumbling through the air. 
As it crashed into the shoreline, the three of them all ran to take a look. The boat had been squeezed and compacted until it was the shape and size of a board game box. Oh, my lord, the king groaned. I think we made him angry. A sudden gurgling sound made their gazes shoot up and into the lake once more. The water very close to the dock was bubbling madly. And then he emerged. The serpent's face rose from the waters of Snowshoe Lake, glaring down at the three humans before him. He was huge, impossibly huge, his face at least six feet across and packed with razor-sharp teeth. Spines jutted out from his face at various angles. The spines on top of his head collected a large mass of bits of old fishing lines and lures, giving him the appearance of a sparkling crown. His gaze first settled on Alan and Lana, who had sunk to their knees and were holding each other in terror as they stared into the serpent's glowing red eyes. He stretched his neck out of the water and brought his face right up to the two of them, so close they could almost touch him. From the depths of his throat came a growl, a deep and primal sound that had not been heard on the surface for thousands of years. It was a growl that was meant to say one thing very, very clearly. You have been warned. With a small snort of satisfaction, the serpent turned his gaze to the king. The king immediately straightened up and gave the serpent a smart salute. The serpent tilted his head slightly, regarding this, and finally gave the king a slow nod. One king acknowledging another. With that, the serpent turned and slipped back into the water. Within moments, the water's surface was as smooth as glass once more. Alan had finally found his voice and was babbling over and over. Uh, uh, I can't believe it! I can't believe it! What a find! What a find! We need to go! We need to go, go now! Call, call the people! The, the, the science people! All the science people! A, a creature this size living in a lake! It's, this is it's amazing! It's like, I can't believe it! I'm gonna go learn and study and everything! The king took a long, slow, deep breath. You know, kids, uh, I think it'd be better if we keep this little encounter quiet. Uh, what happens to Snowshoe stays at Snowshoe, as I always say. Alan gaped. What? what? Uh, no! This is the scientific find of the century. Uh, we'll all be world famous in a couple of days. Uh, I don't know about that, the king drawled. But all I do know is what that fella did there to my boat when he was peeved, and uh, I can't imagine what he might do to a pack of scientists who were trying to poke and prod and uh, invade his home. Oh, Alan sighed, slumping over. I didn't think of that. Oh, boy. Lena helped him to his feet. I think you're right, Mr. King. Uh, it's best for us to go back and... Uh, no! Oh, Misty! We didn't tell Misty what we'd be doing all day. She must be worried sick. I'll give you a ride back over, smiled the king. Drag your canoe up that way, and uh, we'll put it on the back of our truck. It'd be nice to catch up with young Misty a spell, too. The three of them were silent as they rode the mile or so back to the sawdust pile. Misty was sitting by a roaring fire, waving to them as they walked in. There they are. Thanks for entertaining them for a spell, Mr. King. Lena gaped as she looked over at Misty. Her clothing was torn nearly to shreds, and it looked like she had been dragged through the dirt and mud. Misty, what happened to you? Misty shrugged. Yeah, n uh, not too much. Uh, I chased Bowie into a bear's den. I uh, had to rest them all to give Bowie enough time to run away. Uh, then the bears named me their queen, and I had to fight off the evil king to save all the bear kind. Uh, just the usual day. How about you guys? Ellen plopped down in front of the fire. Oh, uh, you know... We performed an experiment to find out if the serpent of the snowshoe lake really existed, uh, which actually made him really, really mad. He crunched up the king's boat and uh, tossed his CD player halfway to Canada. Pretty usual day, all in all. Ah. Got any dogs left? The king asked, easing himself down into a chair. Misty thumped the top of the cooler with her outstretched foot. Of course. Lena grabbed four skewers from the picnic table and gave everyone a hot dog and bun to roast. The four of them all sat silently for a few moments, cooking and staring into the flames. As the crackling sparks from the pine logs rose into the night sky, one last word was uttered. It was a perfect word, 
the only word that could possibly summarize the adventures they had just experienced. Aya! Thank you for listening. <laughs>